Hi, my name is Paul Merriman. And uh, for those of you who are new, I want to just take a couple of minutes talking about the importance of this particular presentation and to show you how we are here to help you be a better investor. So uh, I hope you find this of interest and to you old timers who have sat through this presentation many times before as we update this every year and we have the new 2023 update here. Uh, you'll note it's in a slightly different format. I want to thank Rob Berger, I think one of the finest presenters uh, on investing on the internet uh, for uh, motivating me to do it in this uh, uh, more casual but hopefully a helpful way. So we have this discussion of the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And I just want you to know that this portfolio was first introduced in the 90s. And uh, we have been updating it uh, while I was in the business. And then when I retired in 2012 uh, to start the Financial Education Foundation, uh, we, uh, we continue to update this information and uh, help people take advantage of all of this research. So I hope you find this helpful. Uh, first thing here is about our mission. I think it's important to understand the reason I'm about to take you into the depths <laughs> that I'm going to, that I'm going to, because there's gonna be a lot of numbers. They're all important numbers because our foundation is dedicated to helping do-it-yourself investors. That doesn't mean that somebody who's hired an advisor will not get some good information here. In fact, maybe you'll question whether you're getting the good advice you thought that you were. But the bottom line is, we want to provide to you the information and the tools that will, in fact, help you be a better do-it-yourself investor. And we try our best to make everything free. There's hardly anything on our website where you uh, have to write a check or, or order anything. So that's the focus of today. One of the, we want to call it the missions of, the, uh, of this foundation is to help you be a better investor. Now, there are, there are a number of ways that, that we do that. The first is, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, is identifying the very best equity asset classes. If you're looking for growth, most passive investors, I'm not talking about people who are starting a business. I'm talking about people putting money into an IRA or a 401k or a taxable account. But, and by the way, long-term, it's not about short-term investing, but we do believe, and the academics have taught us, that that growth of your assets uh, is going to probably come best from equities. So this presentation is about identifying uh, that group of equity funds that you could put into your portfolio and believe that you were headed in the right direction. Now, in the coming weeks, I will do similar presentations that will focus on the com combination of equity asset classes. Now, I'll do a little of that today, but the next presentation will be a deeper dive. And then we want to know how to add fixed income or bonds to the portfolio to reduce the volatility. Certainly at my age, 79, I'm going to have less in equities than a 20-year-old should. And what we'll talk about how to, how to combine fixed income with equities. And we'll talk to people who are in the accumulation phase of their life. And we'll show some wonderful uh, uh, tables that show the impact of starting with a very small amount of money and building a, a portfolio over a long period of time. I think anybody in their 20s or their 30s We'll find that presentation of interest. We then will do a presentation, in fact, a, a couple, where we'll talk about the distribution strategies that you might use in order to get the most out 
of your investments in retirement. And then we will do a piece on selecting uh, ETFs and mutual funds, because a lot of people, in fact, I had a meeting over a Zoom call this morning, and somebody said, look, just tell me what funds I should be in and how much. Well, all of these presentations are really working to give you the evidence of how all that should be put together. And that's all based on what we've learned from the academics. But then there is the question, what ETFs and what mutual funds, and we provide those to you. And while you don't see it here on the list, because it isn't exactly about investing, but we have developed a group of what we call truth tellers. Now, don't we, get, we don't get one penny from any of these people for recommending them. These are the people that, for the other kinds of information beyond investing that you will likely need, these are the people that we would suggest you should watch the, the, the work that they're doing. I mentioned Rob Berger and, and, and many others who I think are straight shooters in terms of giving you the right advice. So let's talk here about the ultimate buy and hold strategy. I am gonna be using a lot of numbers, tons of numbers. And there's really only one that you need to see, but I wanna show you how we get there. And I want you to understand the pieces of the pie we're gonna to put together uh, beyond just the name. And I also want you to understand that everything that I show you here is hypothetical. And I don't care if it's real-time results or the result of some study going back to 1970. Now that's pretty easy, but when we go back to 1928 with a lot of our other studies, it, it depends on a lot of academic research to pull all that information out and create the returns of different asset classes. But here we're gonna have a, a relatively recent time period from 1970 through 2022, 53 years of time. Now that's, that's a fair amount of time. That's an amount of time that allowed you to see some horrific bear markets. In fact, uh, two of those bear markets came in, inside of, of 10 years, which is unusual. And uh, it will get you into some wonderful bull markets because uh, certainly we had periods from 1970 to 2022 where things were just great. And let me tell you where most people uh, actually were rewarded for having taken the risk. And, 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 and it's the benchmark of all U.S. equity investors, almost all U.S. equity investors, and that's the S&P 500. So I'm going to start with the assumption that you had $100,000 to invest in 1970. You weren't going to put any more money in. You weren't going to take any money out. All the dividends and capital gains, whatever happened inside that, that, that portfolio, were going to remain. So, oh, and there are no taxes. There is, a, there's an applied management fee, operating expense in these asset classes, much like you would find in these kinds of investments today, but very different from the past because today the cost of getting access to the S&P 500 is many times cheaper percentage-wise than, than it was when they first became available in 1976. So here's what I want you to know about the S&P 500. And this is really important. It is a combination of growth and value. It is driven more by growth than it is by the value part of the portfolio. Growth being the very popular companies and the companies that have uh, the anticipated future returns that are much higher than the out of favor value companies. Now, when I say out of favor, I don't mean that they have a problem. They just aren't as exciting in terms of the future. Now, that sounds like that growth should be the place 
that you would want all of your money. Well, it turns out, again, according to the academic research, that the growth companies don't end up making more than value companies and may often for very long periods of time underperform value. Now we'll talk more about that in the, in the, in the coming minutes, but I just want you to think in terms of that portfolio being mostly growth. And when I tell you that over the last 53 years, without money going in or taking any money out or paying any taxes, you would have had a 10%, 10.4% return annualized. And that would have turned the $100,000 into almost $19 million. That's a phenomenal return, isn't it? I mean, I think most people, certainly people my age, would say if I could find a way to get a 10% pound pound rate of return, depend and, and to be able to depend on that return, they want to sign up because that's a great long-term return during a period of time, by the way, that inflation was around 3% on average going, going back, well, a little higher since 1970. But if you go back to 1928, inflation has been around 3%. Now, there's more about the S&P 500 you should understand. There's nothing passive. It is not a buy and hold strategy in and of itself. You could buy and hold the S&P 500, but every year a committee, and by the way, uh, a committee today may make a decision that would be very different if that same committee was looking at at, 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 at companies in a different period of time. So it's going to be based on the belief systems of a group of people as to what 500 companies would you want to have in that portfolio? Well, here's the reason that, that we should not, when I say take it seriously, understand that when you look backwards over this 53 year period, that if you look from 1970 on, and I'll have a link to this study, these, these uh, returns going back to 1970, but who, which companies were at the top of the list of those 500 companies? Big, big companies. Well, if you went back to 1970, the biggest companies were, were auto companies. If you looked at the top 10, three of them, Ford, GM, Chrysler. And in fact, in those days, because I was around the industry in those days, one of the old sayings was, as goes General Motors, so goes the United States. Well, we don't feel that way anymore, but that was the way it was back then. And along with those three, four of those 10 big companies were energy, oil companies, Exxon being the largest of the group. And there was also GE and it and and IBM. And of course, the famous companies of today weren't even around then. And if you looked at GE today, it's been out of favor for years. GM went through a bankruptcy. And, and, and Chrysler as well. I mean, these these companies that made up, if you chose the handful of companies that you want to put your money away and hold forever in 1970, you might have picked those top 10 companies. But also in that list of 500 in 1970 was all of Eddie Underwood. It was number 497. And if you read the history of Olivetti Underwood at Wikipedia, you will find a corporate life not so unlike the personal lives that people live. Periods of, of, of great results, periods of terrible challenges and bad results. And of course, typewriters aren't all that popular anymore. So when you buy those companies, your odds of doing well over the long term is actually not very good. But if you simply bought the whole package, all of those companies, and you can today, thanks to originally in 1976, 
John Bogle creating the S&P 500 index fund. So when we talk about buy and hold, we're talking about buying and holding an asset class, a group of stocks that will change. In fact, of every 10 years, I went back and looked at every 10 years, going back to 1970, and in every 10 years, you would have a turnover at around 200 companies. So I would call that active management. My idea is for it to be a passive buy and hold investment for the long term. Warren Buffett actually thinks it is the best investment in and of itself for the long term. A lot of people do. And I don't want to forget to add here, the total market index, which is very popular with a lot of investors over the S&P 500, it's virtually the same thing because the very large companies really drive the return of those particular indexes. And in fact, if you go back to 1928, and the academics have done this and recreated the S&P 500 and recreated the total market index, there's a one-tenth of 1% 1 difference in return, advantage S&P 500. So I know that this has been a great place to have money invested for the long term. I also have an idea of how volatile it is by its standard deviation. Now, I don't care if you know exactly how a standard deviation works, but I just want you for, for comparable purposes, understand that it's a measure of volatility. Lower numbers suggest less volatility, higher numbers suggest higher volatility. And so here the number is 17.2%. And just quickly, that means that two thirds of the annual returns will fall between 10.4 plus 17.2% and 10.4 and minus 17.2%. So it's a huge, it's a range within which returns could be relatively normal. Now, I want you to understand as an investor, that means if you're not experienced at this, that it's normal to be up 20%. It's normal to be down 10%. It's not abnormal to be up 30%. So I'm just saying that it is one way. In the next pod podcast and, and uh, video that we do, and we're going to be doing with every one of these uh uh, seven or eight topics, we're going to do both a podcast and we're going to do a video because when I'm talking lots of numbers like I am here, I just feel like I've got to be here with the numbers with you and walk you through them very carefully. So it's a little, little difficult to do on taking a walk through the park. So I want to know something. The academics have told us and shown us with numbers that there are many different types of asset classes from big companies to small companies, growth companies to value companies, US, international, emerging markets, REITs. And these do not go up and down together. And, and, and we'll talk a little about uh, how much they differ. But my bottom line point here is the academics have, have in essence blessed this list of 10 equity asset classes I'm going to talk about. So let me show you what we've been doing since the mid-90s. We've been building a, a table that kind of like this first table. And, and, and when I say kind of like that first table, the, the main point here yeah, it, it is that we did it originally and we accepted the idea of 10%, I'm sorry, 60% in equity, 40% in fixed income. And we showed the implication not only of how you would have done had you been all equities, but we've showed and in the end showed it with 40% bonds in working along with, together, the equity portion. 
People thought we meant that was the ultimate buy and hold strategy. No, it wasn't the combination of 60-40. It was how the equity portion was configured. So it's a little different today as we present it than it was in the mid-90s. But we've been doing the same basic review every year, updated for whatever the last year uh, provided to an understanding of the, the way this all works. But here is the first step that you do. And I want you to look down at the bottom of this page. The bottom uh, uh, table down here shows portfolios one through seven. I don't wanna suggest that I'm recommending these individual portfolios. I'm just going to look at those portfolios and portfolio number one was the S&P 500, 100%, but portfolio number two is adding 10% to large cap value as an index, all of the companies that qualify as large cap value. Now, I got to warn you, I don't care if you're looking at large cap value, small cap value, mid cap value, there are many different indexes that are created that are given that name. So we happen to use the work that has been created by dimensional fund advisors an academically driven, not only a group of funds, uh, but also academically driven results having gone back and looked at investing the way they think is in your best interest. And I'm here to agree with them and to share with you. And here's what we know. And I call this about as, as magic as it can be. You take that same S&P 500, and instead of having it all in that, just take 10% so that you have a portfolio, as you see in portfolio two, 90% in the S&P 500, 10% in large cap value. Now, one of the lessons from this study, I think, is the impact of small changes. Because look what happened to the compound rate of return. It went from 10.4 to 10.6. Most people would not have a clue as to what that, I wouldn't, what that would do to the return, that extra two tenths of 1%. And these are rounded numbers so that it's not exactly 10.6 or exactly 10.4, but with rounding two tenths. Look at that, $20.8 million instead of $19 million. You have just added almost $1.9 million to that $100,000 investment with what I call about the biggest baby step I've ever seen. I mean, it's just a small change in the portfolio. So when somebody says, put all your money in the S&P 500, I say, well, have you ever looked at a list of the companies inside of large cap value? They're mostly well-known companies. They're just, they're, they're not cutting edge companies in the minds of investors. And they tend to pay more in dividends. But it made a difference. And look at the standard deviation. It's the same. It's basically the same. One-tenth of 1% 1 is nothing. Even a 1% difference would not be considered a big deal. But then what happens if you take another baby step and you add 10% to small cap blend? Oh, blend growth and value, but with small companies instead of large companies. And those large companies are worth 100 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion. They're big, big companies. And the small company blend mutual funds are made up or indexes are made up of companies that are maybe two or 3 billion or 4 billion. They're small compared to the giants, but they're real companies. They're not penny stocks. But notice what happens when we added the small cap blend. You get a one-tenth of 1% 1 better return. And it takes the portfolio from 20.8 million to 22.3 million. That is not chump change. That is, that is important. And by the way, 
53 years for a lot of people. There are people, I just went to a conference down in, in, uh, in Phoenix for the White Coat Investors Conference where there were a whole bunch of people in their 30s and their 40s, most of them physicians, a few older people, but they were mostly the teachers. And these are people planning on living another 40 or 50 years. So 53 years is not impossible. It's impossible for me. But but our, our, our granddaughter who was born last November, and we put money aside for her to be invested over a lifetime and to grow over a lifetime. And in her case, that money is going to probably grow for 95 to 100 years uh, out. And that's something that a lot of us grandparents and parents should be aware that there are ways to put small amounts of money away now and to see these huge returns over a long, a long period of time, or when maybe there will be no earth. We don't know. The future is always unknown. So same standard deviation or volatility. And you've gone from about 19 million to over 22 million. And then you put another 10% into the gold ring of asset classes historically. I have to mention historically, because again, doesn't mean it will be this way in the future. And what do we know? We know by adding 10%, it goes from a 10.7% compound rate of return to 11.1, and now we're at $27 million with only having 30% of your portfolio in other than S&P 500. And somebody tells me that you should just put your money in the total market index and walk away and say, that's enough. Well, it's great. And if it lets you sleep well and adding these little pieces of these other asset classes causes you to lose sleep, I want you to get back in the S&P 500 and just stay there because I don't wanna do anything to scare you out of equities. But I think before I'm done, I'll have a good chance at convincing you that adding these other equities could actually reduce your volatility. Then we add an asset class that adds very little to the return, in fact, it adds about $600,000 to the return, and those are real estate investment trusts, public mutual funds, or ETFs, that have about the same return as the S&P 500, historically. What they do is they don't go up and down with these other asset classes. They are considered by the academics as a separate asset class class because they don't go up and down together. And you will notice that the volatility goes down to 17.1 and it adds one-tenth of one percent. And now, if you will allow me to do four asset classes at one time, and the reason I want to do four at one time is because I wouldn't want to recommend any one of those four for you to stand alone as an investment. But as a foursome, I'm very secure in adding international large cap blend, international large cap value, international small cap blend, and international small cap value, 10% of each of those. Now, for those of you who just don't like putting money internationally, I'm going to show you how to build these portfolios without international securities. In fact, I'll show you how to do everything you got going on here with just two funds. Now, what happened when you added those small pieces is that you added uh, another, basically, went from 11.2 to 11.7, Four of them, which means they averaged an increase of about 1.25% each, if you want to look at it like that. 
Well, in fact, the small cap international value did better than the large cap international value. But I'm just saying that if you had all four of them, you would have been fine. And you'd now be up to 35.6 million, at which point you add one more asset class. And this will give you 10. And that asset class is emerging markets. And you can see it was a 12.1% compound rate of return. And the total now is at $41.8 million instead of $18.9 million. And the standard deviation is about 1% higher, a little more than 1%. And if you have the ability to look at the market through the eyes of a long-term investor, and this is one of the biggest challenges for investors to actually do and get what a long-term strategy that's broadly diversified amongst equity asset classes like this and like other combinations that you would likely do well, but people get hung up on the events along the way. I wouldn't blame somebody on October 19th, 1987, to conclude that they didn't want to be an investor anymore because on October 19th, 1987, it fell in one day, the S&P 500, 22%. And what would keep it from continuing to do that day after day. Well, actually, I mean, it, it, it hasn't happened that way, but I can tell you back in the, in the 30s, the volatility was much higher than today. The market was less liquid, by the way, too. I mean, there, there, there are reasons the times don't relate, but it's interesting because during the 1929 through 1938 terrible market, the return was actually better then than it was from 2000 to 2009 in the S&P 500. And that's before you, infl you adjusted for inflation because back then we had deflation. Now we've had inflation, which means that the 2000 through 2009 period was actually more worse. So, the point here is not to advocate for any of these individual asset classes, but to look at the possibility. It's not so different if you think about it. For someone saying, hmm, wonder if I should invest in the best 10 stocks in the S&P 500 rather than all 500. I mean, why should I do 500 when 10 of them will likely do better? Well, the reality is we're happy to have 500 because we know that we might have picked Enron as one of our 10. We might have picked Eastern Airlines. We might have picked Washington Mutual. I mean, the, the, the fact is, is that, well, at least what the academics tell us, is you are likely to get a better rate of return with more companies rather than with less. And that a couple of drivers of long-term returns, equity asset classes, and also the driver expenses. Keep your expenses low and of course your taxes too and be in the right equity asset classes. And because in, in my case at 79, if I get another 11 years, that'll be a big deal for me. And I have no idea which of all of these different asset classes are going to be the big winners or the smaller losers, if that's what we go through. So personally, I like having all 10. But I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of people who don't like doing all 10 because all 10 is more work than just doing two, which is why I'm so happy to be able to show you two that are just as good as what you see here in terms of return and still have quite a bit of uh, diversification. 
There is another wonderful lesson on this page. You're going to come to so many forks in the road as an investor. Save versus invest. Stocks versus bonds. Big versus small. High expenses versus low expenses. You know all of these things that you're going to have to decide. What about rebalancing? Now, I know people who have never rebalanced, ever. And I know people who rebalancing is an annual, and in some cases, a monthly exercise. And rebalancing is basically, let's say that you decided to be half in stocks and half in bonds, and the market doesn't just go up in that percentages all the time and down. So that once in a while you go in and if the stock's been doing better, you take some of the stock results or uh, returns and move them over into the bonds so that you're back to what you consider to be your favorite asset allocation with bonds and stocks. And people can do that with these different equity asset classes as well. But I want you to see exactly the same equities, okay? That instead of 12.1%, if you rebalanced annually, notice with annual rebalancing versus below the middle uh, table is monthly rebalancing. Picking from the most productive and giving to the least productive more often and the compound rate of return was three tenths of 1% less. And the standard deviation was about 1% less. Because by rebalancing often, you are in fact historically reducing the volatility often. And there's a cost to that. The whole idea of investing is to get a premium for risk. And what people need to understand is there are a lot of decisions we can make that will reduce that premium. I mean, if I encourage you, as so much of the industry does, to put your money into mutual funds that cost a half of 1% more, sometimes 1% more a year, you would understand as you see these small differences in return here leading to big amounts of money that that is something you don't want to do. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on and show you something. And I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on this because this will be discussed in more detail since this is another topic unto itself. And that is how to combine those different equity asset classes. Notice down here at the bottom of this particular PowerPoint that we have all these different portfolios now, worldwide ultimate buy and hold, four fund worldwide, four fund US worldwide, all value, no growth, US all value, worldwide, all small cap. Here's US all small cap. That would be like owning the S&P 500 only, which is going to be very volatile. And you will see at some point in these presentations, very profitable historically in the past. And finally, I think a killer portfolio for a lot of young people is half in the S&P 500 and half over here in small cap value. So in each of these portfolios, we have said, this is the asset allocation. What, how much in each equity asset class? Notice S&P 500, remember the $100,000 grew to 18.9. With the ultimate buy and hold over almost, it's almost 42 million for the four fund worldwide instead of the 10 fund worldwide, 43 million. The four fund US, I love this portfolio. This portfolio is 25% each in small cap blend, small cap value, large cap value in the S&P 500. And you would have had about $41 million. The all value, remember the all value I said has produced better returns than the all growth. 
or a combination of growth and value. And there it is, almost $64 million. All small cap worldwide, half in international, half in US, over 100 million. And here is clear over here to the right is the combination of the S&P 500 and a small cap value, about $46 million. Now, I mean, I could say this a hundred times during this presentation. There is no guarantee uh, stamp on this page anywhere. I can't even guarantee that for 53 years, stocks will beat bonds. I can't even guarantee that the seventh biggest company in America, Enron, might not go broke sometime in the future as it did in the past, but it won't be called Enron. In fact, according to studies going back to 1926, about half of the companies that ever went public, about half of them either went out of business or did not make more than 3% over their lifetime. In some cases, they survived, but they got merged into some other company because on their own, they weren't going anywhere. So these numbers show, oh, by the way, I, I, I should mention, you can also see the standard deviation. And you'll see it ranges here from 17.2 all the way here to 22.6. I want you to notice that one that took you from about 19 million over here to the far right to 46 million, that's, that, that volatility is 18.4 versus the 17.2. And when we go deep, take a deeper dive into these organizations, you're going to find out that the losses were actually smaller with this combination than they were with the S&P 500. And here again, we have the impact of rebalancing, 12.3 here, uh, for example, uh, with the two fund, and down here it's 12.2, never rebalancing. I'm sorry, monthly rebalancing. It gets bigger, never rebalancing, not smaller. This is a lot of information really fast, but all I want you to know, because we're putting together this series where in each case, there's a point we're trying to make, and maybe you'd just like to hang up the phone here and say, okay, I got it, Paul, but I'd like you to see some more. I really would, because I want you to know you don't have to be 50-50 U.S. international. You could be 70-30, 70, 70 U.S., 30 international, because we have 198 tables on our website. And all of the po portfolios that we have, when we show them in terms of distributions, when we show them in the fine-tuning tables, when we show them in the accumulation, we have tables for the 70-30, just like we do for the 50-50. And by the way, I think most people in the U.S. would rather be 70-30 than 50-50 because they trust the U.S. more than they trust the international. That is what we call home bias, and it is so unbelievably human. So there are some differences, but the returns, you know, it's not like they're wildly different. Uh, a different notice over here, number seven. Before, if we go back, a couple of here, a couple of uh, of, of uh, slides. We'll see it was twelve point one, and now it's twelve point zero. So very similar returns, and it could be for the for 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 the next fifty three years, those two could be reversed. And again, you're going to see the returns are lower when you rebalance more often. But instead of 50-50, it is 70-30. And you'll notice that Daryl Balls, who, by the way, I just, I want to tip my hat to. I should have mentioned him. One of the first things I said when I opened my mouth was, thank you, Daryl Balls, because Daryl Balls, one of our handful of volunteers, 
puts in hundreds of hours every year creating this set of tables. As I said, there are almost 200 of them. But notice the configuration is a little different here. In order to go to the 7030, understand that instead of going in 10% increments, we go in 14% increments as we add the US. And when we get to the internationals, they are 6% increments instead of the 10% increments we had before. So it is loading the asset classes uh, with different amounts. So, so that can be one of the reasons those returns are different. But it is amazing how, how, how close they are, whether you're 50-50 or 70-30. So confidence and comfort and consistency might be better for you if you did 70-30. But that's a choice you have. And again, with the 70-30, we show you here all of those combinations with 70-30. Now, it's not going to make any difference to the uh, uh, portfolios that are, all, that are all U.S., but it will make a difference to those that are worldwide. And notice the all worldwide, excuse me, worldwide all value had a... 64.5 $64 million dollar outcome. If we go back a couple of, whoops, a couple of, here we go, 59, almost 60 million. So it actually did better, considerably better uh, with the, the overweighting to US because US value did better during that period of time. Now, there are so many stories, but understand those stories are reflections of combinations that while I think you'll be rewarded and get a premium for these combinations, we have no idea what that premium will be. And now I want to show you, and I don't expect you to be able to see all the small numbers. I just, from 30,000 feet, I love this table. This table has been downloaded more since it came out than any other table that we have uh, uh, shared with people because it gives us a chance to do something really cool. There are, there are many different potential combinations for you as an investor. I don't care whether you have the total market index or you have the S&P 500 because here what we have is the S&P 500 and small cap value. On the left hand, far left, we have the 100% S&P 500. Over here on the almost far right, we have 100% small cap value. And right next to small cap value, just to compare uh, how the, it did to the S&P 500, that is the S&P 500 benchmark without any fees. So the returns are a little bit higher for the index itself. Fees have been uh, uh, added uh, to the management of the S&P and small cap value. I think it's 25 basis points a year for small cap value and 100 per, and, and sorry, 10 basis points for the S&P 500. The reason I love this right here is one thing I can do, I can go down this with one finger tracking down the 100% S&P, the other finger tracking down the 100% small cap value, and boy, I'll be able to see one year at a time if I want how much they were alike or different. And I'll find like 1977, the S&P 500 is down 7.7. The small cap index was, was up, what, 22.2? This is great because you have these two great asset classes doing different things at different times, and that has a tendency to reduce the volatility. And you can see it right here. If you looked at 50-50, half in the S&P 500, half in small cap value, you'll see the compound that return was, was for 1977 was 6.6%.
So you can see the implication of having just 10% in or 20% in small cap value or 30. And I want to and I look at 2000 through 2001, three terrible years for the S&P 500. Over here, we have small cap value. Two of those years, it made money. And the other, it was not a wipeout. Would you be happy with that performance? Well, in fact, the 50-50 performance for those three years shows you one year, you did lose a little tiny bit. One year, you made money. And the other year, instead of losing 22, you lost, in the S&P, you lost 15 Point six. And sometimes, like 2008, it'll be just the same. 2008 minus 37, minus 36.8. I mean, it's virtually the same. So you'll have some years like that on the upside, on the downside. But I want you to see something I think is important. And we should know about our portfolio. And that is, what is the risk exposure? And here you'll notice that the S&P 500 on its own had a 12-month period. It lost 43.3. And the small cap value, 49.3. And yes, over short periods of time, and a year is short, small cap value is going to be more volatile. But when we go out over, let's say, 60 months, the worst 60 months for the S&P 500, a minus 6.7 versus a minus 8.2. Now, it was worse. And again, even five years is a relatively short period of time. And you will, as we dig deeper into these combinations, be able to see these numbers applied to those saving and applied to those taking money out. Of course, taking money out, we want to see some bonds in there along with these particular asset classes. Now here you can take a closer look at the bottom part of that table. You can see from 10.4 to 13.6, 17.1 standard deviation, 22.5. Most of that difference in volatility is to the upside, not to the downside. And you can see the worst 12 months. So if somebody is sitting in an all S&P 500 portfolio, I'm saying, come with me and look at this. If you had 10% in small cap value, your worst 12 months would have been six tenths of 1% more. If you were 20% in, it would have been eight tenths. I'm sorry, 1.2%. Uh, if you had been 30%, it would have been almost 2%, the worst 12 months. You wouldn't even have known the difference if you were living through it unless somebody told you. You would have known it was a period you didn't want to be in, but you wouldn't sit and compare those two. But I just want you to see what that comparison is with the addition of a little bit of small cap value. Now, my wife and I, we are about 25% in small cap value and 25% in small cap blend. Then about half of the small cap blend is small cap value. So we have over 25% in small cap value in our equity part of our portfolio. Now I wanna talk ever so briefly, particularly for people who are with us for the first time how we can help you other than these, 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 these topics I think are so important. I think the bottom line is if you follow our work that you will have a better sense of the evidence, the historical evidence of investing because 
all of the academics would say, if you have to choose between evidence-based investing, investing and story-based investing, where somebody tells you a story about why the future is going to be a certain way, even though they know they don't know, and you know they don't know, but somehow they have you temporarily believe they know. This is all based on not knowing the future. I think also what comes out of this education is your family members will become better do-it-yourself investors. I have hundreds of emails from people who have said not only have they applied this, but they have their children using these kinds of strategies. And you will pass on to friends and associates and help them be better do-it-yourself investors. A lot of our work has to do with 401k plans. And there's work that we do that very specifically is aimed at people in 401k plans. Special, and, and I will not be making that presentation, but the man who developed one of the best strategies I've ever seen, it's called Two Funds for Life, Chris Pedersen, will be sharing that information. And I do believe to the extent that you are a teacher, either whether you're paid for it or, or whether you're doing it as I do without compensation, you're still a teacher. And all of these lessons I think are valuable. But then there's a link here to trusted sources. We have developed and it will grow a list of what we call truth tellers. And they are people we think you can trust when you see the work that they, they provide on the internet. We all know the internet, the internet is filled with bad information, whether it's political or business or investing or lifestyle and and these are people that have passed at least the tests that we have to be considered trusted. So how you can help us, I mean, those are the things we're trying to do for you. We have on our website, if you're a first time visitor, articles, podcasts, free books, videos, pass those along. If you find them helpful to you, Pass them along to others. Share your stories of success or support of the work that we're, that we're doing. We won't use your name in a quote unless you say, go ahead and fine with me. That's great because if people see a name, they feel like it's, it's probably more likely to be real than if there is no name. But it's just the statement that somebody else has been there, looked at this stuff, and has been found something about it that they want others to know about. If you are the kind who will write a review, whether it's an Amazon, iTunes, or YouTube, please help us. And my email address, paul at paulmerriman.com, you want to tell me how you think we can improve what we're doing? I am all ears. I am listening. Now, there's a limit to what we can do. Uh, most of the money that's been put up um, to uh, support this, and even my IRA when I die, uh, goes on to support the work of the, of the financial foundation here, financial education foundation. And we also underwrite a class at Western Washington University. But people can donate to our work. But your feedback, your donations, but most importantly, is that somehow putting a stamp of approval on what we're doing to those that you think would be helped. And two books free. Why are they free? Well, you can go buy them at Amazon and all of the royalties and whatever that, that premium profit is uh, that comes out of buying a book at Amazon, it goes into the foundation. So. I cannot take a profit. As a matter of fact, Chris Patterson, who put hundreds of hours into this book, he too has donated any of the royalties and makes the book free, available 
as PDFs. Now there's a very specific reason they're PDFs. They're PDFs because you can then share them with anybody you want and they're gonna be free. And by the way, you will have then gotten the, the link to the PDF. And when you send that PDF to your friends and family, they are not gonna be tracked by us. They're going to be able to look at the book and not be worried about somebody sending them something. So uh, th that's, we want this book in the hands, uh, books in the hands of as many people as possible. And again, my email address, paul at paulmerriman.com. Please sign up for our free newsletter. And, uh, and by the way, that book, the, the We're Talking Millions, it comes as an audio file as well for people who, uh, who like to listen rather uh, than to read. And join us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and, and, and Twitter. So I hope you will find this, this video helpful. I would love your feedback on this because I've never done this before. Uh, I just sat down here as Rob Berger does with his computer and made this without the help of Chris or Daryl or somebody else. And if this works, by golly, I'll do more of these because again, I find Rob Berger's work so helpful and I hope this will make our work uh, more useful to you. Thank you as always for joining us and uh, pass it on.